Okay, once again, once again, good morning, everyone, and thanks uh, to Ellie and Adele for uh, managing this year. Uh, it's always an enjoyable, very much an enjoyable group um, to uh, get together and learn some Torah together. We are, if you remember, we are in Bereshit chapter four, and we're trying to, in a sense, my goal in this year is to sort of look at those parts of the Torah that are often not studied so much in depth. Uh, and we're, we're looking at the moment at Bereshit chapter four, uh, Cain and Hevel. I, I think this will probably be the last year on Cain and Hevel, then we'll move on to the next episode. But Cain and Hevel chapter four is a very, such a fascinating and interesting uh, a chapter with so much in it that uh, I thought I'd like to uh, share it with you. Just to pick up where we left off in the last year. Um, so Cain, of course, commits the first murder um, in the Torah, kills his brother Hevel. And uh, we looked at Cain and Hevel symbolizing different perspectives on life from what, is, what, what moved Cain to do what he did. But then he compounds his Avera by this uh, notorious statement of Hashomer Ochi Onochi, am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? And, and this is the, uh, uh, this is really, in, in a sense, uh, almost as bad as the act itself, that he denies any responsibility for another human being. And what I ended the shir with last week was to explain how um, in general, uh, all these uh, disasters in Bereshis are designed to give us a perspective against which we can measure the, the importance of the, uh, uh, of the lives of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. That what they did was they came to remedy, if you like, all the, um, uh, all the flaws of mankind against a background of people like Cain. So I, I, what I explained to you at the end of the last year was Yehuda. Yehuda was the person who was Metaken. He, he remedied this statement of Cain. When, while Cain said, Hashoba, Ochi, Onochi, my brother's keeper, Yehuda says to his father about Binyamin, Onochi Ervenu, Miyodi Tabakshera, I will be an Orev, I will be a guarantor for my brother, I will lay down my life rather than see anything happening to my brother. And that was really the mirror image, the exact opposite of the denial of Cain was the acceptance of responsibility um, of, uh, of Yehuda. I also mentioned that actually fast forwarding a thousand years, um, more than a thousand years, uh, the, this bond between Yehuda and Binyamin actually changed Jewish history, because when the 10 tribes were exiled um, during the first temple period, the only two tribes that remained were Yehuda and Binyamin. The whole of Klal Yisrael was then built on these two tribes, Yehuda and Binyamin, and the reason suggested why they were of such special strength, um, because they, that they worked together, because they strengthened each other and they worked together. And in fact, uh, most of us are descendants from either Yehuda or Binyamin because the other 10 tribes uh, were lost. Although there is a view in the Gemara that the Novi Yirmiya went into Ashur and brought back uh, large numbers of the 10 tribes back into Klal Yisrael, but it's difficult, that's not in the Tanakh, but Chazal seems to have had a Masera that the 10 tribes were not completely lost, um, but they were largely, largely lost. Um, we don't know anymore from which tribes we come, but certainly Yehuda and Binyamin were the foundation of the future of Klal Yisrael, and the origin of that was this statement of Yehuda in Parshas Vayeshev, Onochi Ervenu, I will guarantee my brother's life. And the word Orev, I in Reish Beis, I mentioned to you, um, is the principle of mutual responsibility, and later on came to came in Chazal, into the phrase, Kol Yisrael are ravim zel that Kol Yisrael are all mutually responsible uh, for each other, which brings me actually to this week's parsha. It's interesting to connect this idea with this, with this week's parsha in parsha's ki tavo, parsha's ki sovoi, there is a whole uh, a, a account of the uh, ceremony that took place in Hargurizim 
and Har Evo, right? That six, the, the, Har Grisim and Har Evo. Has anybody been to, to see Har Grisim anywhere? If you want to, yes, Dina has. Har Grisim is a place worth visiting um, in the Shomrom. It has very interesting agricultural, agricultural digs there. It has a long and complex uh, history, but the history of Har Grisim begins in Parsha's Kisova, in this week's Parsha, mentioned for the first time. So in actual fact, Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, uh, in, in, in this week's Parsha, when he gives the mitzvah of Har Grisim, he's not yet in the land of Israel. He's projecting forward, when you get into the land of Israel, one of the first things you've got to do is go to Har Grisim and Har Evol, which are two, two mountains, one next to each other, and in the valley between them is the town of Shechem. Uh, in, in the valley between them uh, is, is the town of Shechem. Some people call it Nablus, but we call it Shechem. And, and that's, that was in the, in the valley between them. And if you look at the Psukim in this week's parsha, uh, Klal Yisrael would divide it up. Six tribes went up onto the top of Har Grizim. The other six went up on the top of Har Ebal. And in the middle, some of the Kohenim in the middle actually said, all these, there's a whole text, I'm not going to go into it now, this is not a shir on Parsha La Shavua, but you can look it up in this week's, uh, in this week's Parsha, I think it's in, in, in Ravi, um, this whole episode. What was this whole episode about? What was the point of this particular ceremony? So Rashi tells us, quoting a Gemara in Sanhedrin, that, in actual fact, this was the moment that Klal Yisrael entered into a covenant of Aravim Ze Lozer, the covenant of being mutually responsible for each other, that was effectively uh, uh, created by this ceremony. So it's interesting that actually until they entered the land of Israel, until they entered the land of Israel, this new commitment, this new covenant of of Arevus, of mutual responsibility, hadn't yet been ratified, hadn't yet been, hadn't come into effect yet, only came into effect, and the Mephorshim say, the Maral says, that this has actually got to do with the land of Israel. There's something about the land of Israel, which is the rock foundation of the mutual connection between all members of Kal Israel, both those who live here, those who don't live here, we are all connected through uh, Eretz Yisrael. So actually Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't yet give them fully the covenant between Kol Yisrael Arev and Zelazer because Moshe Rabbeinu never crossed the Yarden. And because he didn't cross the Yarden, he didn't have that possibility to enact Kol Yisrael Arev and Zelazer. But once they crossed the Jordan, so what does the Pesach says? But Ovrochem as a Yarden, as soon as you cross the Jordan, then you should go to Har Grisim and Har Eval and enact this ceremony of, of Kol Yisrael Arevim Zelozeh. But what's interesting, so this is, if you like, the final stage of a, if you like, moral development that the Torah is trying to give us to understand, that actually mankind began with Cain saying, Hashomer Ochi Onochi. That was, if you like, the dark side of human nature total selfishness, egoism, jealousy, all that exists within the human being. That's why it's in the Torah. Cain was a real human being. He had these feelings to the, to the nth degree, and they, they caused him to kill his brother. And against the background of this, then you get the next stage. I mentioned you also last week already. Avraham is willing to risk his life to save Lot in a battle against the four kings where he is heavily outnumbered, but the real statement of Arevus only begins uh, with Yehuda. And Yehuda is, in, in that sense, the it's like a point and a counterpoint. You often get in literature, point and counterpoint. You get you get contrasts. So Cain and Yehuda really uh, contrast each other. And then this uh, concept was finally, if you like, enshrined at Har Grizim and Har Eval, and that's something to look at in this week's parsha and understand uh, what, what's going on there exactly. Uh, the Gemara refers to Har Grizim and Har Eval as a shavua, as a covenant, an oath, 
that Klaus, by saying Omein 11 times, they had to say Omein, by saying Omein, Klaus Yisrael accepted upon themselves this oath, the, 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 this uh, uh, oath of allegiance, but it wasn't just allegiance to the Torah and to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it was allegiance to each other, the mutual responsibility, which is the uh, bedrock, really, of the unity and the eternity uh, of Klaus Yisrael. I remember discussing this concept with my good friend, the late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, um, at some length. If I'm not mistaken, he actually wrote his PhD on the topic of Kol Yisrael Aravim Ze Loze. That was the subject of his uh, PhD in ethics and uh, the concept of it. Um, I must confess, I never read his PhD, but I'd like to. But I'd like to suggest that the concept of Aravus starts with Cain making his statement. Cain's statement just really highlights the need for a, a, a new level of, of human mutual responsibility for each other, which eventually expresses itself in all sorts of mitzvahs, like these are all expressions of mutual responsibility and mutual respect and mutual care, which Cain represents the the, the, the dark side of, of this whole thing. It's very fascinating. Incidentally, Har Grizim is actually famous in certain circles for another reason, uh, because it was the center of the Samaritans. Some of you might have heard of the, of, of the group of people called the Samaritans, um, who were really, who, who, who uh, some of them were Jewish, most of them weren't. The, the Gemara ref, refers to them as Kutim, they were somehow uh, adjacent to the Jewish people, but they, for some reason, they considered Har Gerizim to be the Har Habayit. They, 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 had, they took the view that Avram did the Akeda on Har Gerizim, and therefore all their sacrifices and everything for them, Har Gerizim was their uh, Yerushalayim. Uh, and, and it became famous in many ways in, in that respect. The Samaritans eventually were really, if I'm not mistaken, they were uh, massacred, not by the Jews, but by the Christians who, they upset the Christians for some reason or another. I'm sure somebody maybe knows the history of this more than I do. And uh, there aren't many, aren't many left today. They become a relic, a relic in history. But how Gerizim played an interesting role in uh, the, uh, the Shomronim, uh, the, the, the Samaritans, and uh, uh, their, their uh, strange um, practices. Anyhow, I'll call upon him all in this week's parsha, Grizim and Har Evol, and open a map and have a look at the Shamron near Shechem, and you will see a bit more about these two hills and uh, and the importance of them for our from our perspective is that that was the final, if you like, official uh, um, oath of allegiance of Klal Yisrael to each other, Klal Yisrael Arabim Zelazer, and with that, the Avera of Cain was remedied. Okay, um, let's go back to some text, and there are one or two interesting things. So what happens to Cain after he has, uh, after he's committed this sin? Something uh, remarkable, actually, something that you would not have predicted um, happens to Cain. Let's have a look at this. Let's see if I can get my text up. <sighs> Nope. Bear with me for one second, ladies and gentlemen. Just need to get out my text. Let's try that again. Let's try that again. There we go. I think I've got it now. Good. Yes. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. So this was so we've looked at the beginning of this uh, document, beginning of this paper. We've gone through all this. Just one second. Where do we get to? Right. Yehuda bin Yamin. That's what we looked at last time. Parshas Nitzavim. Right. The, the covenant about Bristol Arvus. Bristol Arvus. Right. Okay. Let's now continue. We're now today. We're going to do the end of chapter four. We're going to cut. We're going to, we're going to be, bring to a conclusion all our knowledge about Cain and Hevel, and we'll see exactly how they uh, how that worked out. 
Just bear with me for one second. Apologies. Okay. So now we're, we're dealing with the aftermath of Kai in killing Heva. So Akarish Baruch says to him, the Atta are now Orur Atta Minho Adama. Asher Potsasa is Piha. Right? You are now cursed from the ground. In other words, until now, Kayan had been uh, an Oved Adama. Uh, we, Kain was described to us as somebody who dedicated his life to cultivating the earth, cultivating the land, and land for him was everything. So Kadosh Baruch says to him, you are now cursed from the land. The land itself has absorbed the blood of your brother. Therefore, because the land, you have contaminated the land, you will no longer be able to benefit uh, from the land. And this is not meant, we'll see in the next possible, it's not meant only agriculturally, but also in terms of residentially. It says, You will work the land, but you will no longer get from the land the strength that it has to give you. Okay, what exactly that means seems to be there was a, a change in the power of agriculture uh, previously, a small amount of agricultural work produced a lot of produce, and from then on, the land only gave a minimum amount of produce. Something changed in terms of the, the uh, fertility and productivity of, of the earth, exactly how we understand that, I'm not going to go into for the moment. And then Akarish Brahma says, not only in terms of agriculture, but also, not the nod to Yerba'oretz. What does that mean? So he translates it here as, you will become a ceaseless wanderer on earth. Nova nod, very interesting uh, phrase that. Nova nod means that you won't feel anymore, you'll be able to live anywhere comfortably, you'll be constantly wanting to move, you'll be constantly moving from place, uh, to, from place. Nun ayin, no. Nun ayin is the, is the root word of all types of uh, movement. For example, tenua. Tenua means traffic, means, means a movement. Uh, when, you, uh, when we want to move something, we want to uh, uh, start your car, your matnia, your matnia, the car. That's the nun ayin word, which means to, to, move, to move around. Uh, nod's not so simple to know exactly what nod means, um, uh, but... Uh, uh, we'll leave that for the moment. I'll call Bonin, that's part of his, uh, part of his, so he, he's given a punishment. What's interesting is, um, one of the interesting questions, is he just committed murder, right? Why does that Karish Baruch say to him, you are high of Misa, you are, it's a capital offense to commit murder, right? Why, why isn't he told that he, he is, his life is forfeit because he's, because uh, he's killed uh, um, Heather. So look at the next pasuk. So by, uh, the next pasuk is very interesting. By Yom Kayin El Hashem Godo Avoni Minasa. My punishment is too great uh, to bear. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? My punishment is too great to bear. So it could be on a simple level that God has given him this terrible punishment that the land, which was his whole life, had been based on his connection to the land, to the earth, was now being pretty much removed from him, and he was going to be a, 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 wandering, a wandering person his whole life. Um, that was uh, too great for him. But have a look at Chazal. Chazal see something else here. So the, the, the first shot is Rashi. Let's have a look. This is the Ramban. Oops. This is the Ramban quoting Rashi. Sorry. Not sure exactly what happened here. Okay, can you see this? Can you see the text, Ali? Yes? So, so Rashi learns, look at this, very interesting. Godol avoni minaso says Rashi, one word. Rashi says, bitmiya. What does bitmiya mean? Any offers on the word bitmiya? 
I'm asking for offers, ladies and gentlemen. What does wonder? That's how it again? Shocked, like wonder. Astonishment. 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 But actually, it means more than that here. That Rashi is telling us that that this, that bitmiyo means this is a question mark. That you shouldn't read it godol avoni minasor. But what Kaim was saying is godol avoni minasor. That's what he was saying. He was questioning God. Bitmiya is a, fr- a word used by Rashi throughout Shas, which means this statement has to be read with a different nigun, right? Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, everything lies in the nigun, even if you're not a chazan. But the nigun is always very important. And, and the truth is, it's very strange. It's strange of Rashi, in a sense, to say this. Um, the truth is, one can always I- invert the meaning of, a, of, of any sentence by putting a question mark at the end. If somebody says, I'm guilty, it means one thing. If he says, I'm guilty, it means something else. It means exactly the opposite, right? If the terror says, low tignov, it means you shouldn't steal. If it says, low tignov, you shouldn't steal, question mark. The question mark inverts the meaning of it. Are you following me? The question mark says, is that really, is that really possible? So that's how Rashi learns. Rashi learns that God of Avodim in his soul, that Kayan is saying, really? Is my sin too great to bear? What does it mean? This is still in Rashi. Ato toen elioni v'tachtonim. You are the creator of the upper and the lower worlds. In other words, the whole cosmos and the spiritual worlds and everything. V'avoni i efshalitoon. And you can't uh, 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 get past my Avera. Right, so what what he's really saying here is that uh, that's Halosh and Rashi, right? This is this is this is Ramban quoting Rashi. So really, according to this, Kayin is asking Akharish Baruch Hu to um, uh, to forgive his Avera, to forgive. And, and look at look at look at the language of the Ramban. It's very amazing. Vahadnochon bepshat says the Ramban. Shehu vidui. Look at this. This is uh, in Yona de Yoma, ladies and gentlemen. Right, we're getting into the Aseret Shemay Teshuva in ten days' time. We're having slichas already this Motzei Shabbos. So somebody can ask you. So you say Oshamnu Bugadnu, right? You do. We do. We say Vidui. We, we confess to our Kadosh Baruch Hu. We confess to our Kadosh Baruch Hu. Somebody, who is the first person in the Tanakh to be recorded as saying Vidui? The answer is Kayin. That's what the Ramban says. Kayin. So here's an interesting thing. And just, I just want to talk about that just for one minute, big, big picture. That, that in actual fact, we find in the Torah great tzaddikim, right? Moshe and Aaron and uh, Miriam, great tzaddikim. And we find great Rashaim, Kayin and Esav and Yishmael. But in actual fact, on closer examination, the Torah does never gives us black and white pictures. The tzaddikim have their flaws, and the rishayim have their redeeming features. In other words, nobody is completely black or white in the Torah. That's one of the beauties of learning the Tanakh be'iyun. And the Torah never shies away from pointing out the shortcomings, even of people like Moshe Rabbeinu and David Amelach and Aaron Akain. They all made mistakes. They all had flaws, right? And, and, and conversely, even the greatest Rashaim, like Cain, okay, Cain is the first murderer. If you ask who is the first great, great villain in the Torah, Cain comes to mind. And yet here he is uh, from his own initiative, understanding that when you have realized you've committed a crime, the first thing to do is vidui. The first thing to do is to say, Oshamnu Bogadnu. Like David HaMelech, right? David HaMelech, when he's told by the Novi with Bathsheba that he'd done something wrong, the first word that comes out of his mi- mouth is Chotosi. That's what he says, Chotosi. And indeed, Odom and Chava are blamed by Chazal for not saying that. Odom and Chava, when they are said by HaKadosh Baruch why did you eat the forbidden fruit? So Odom says it was her fault. And Chava says it was the snake's fault. And neither of them say chotosi. 
Kayin, according to the Ramban's understanding of Godal Avoni Minaso, this is not a question mark like Rashi says it is. It's not a question mark, it's a statement. It's a statement saying this, I've committed, a gr- I now realize I've committed a great sin and I confess my sins to HaKadosh Baruch. Right? That is the power of the video. The power of the video is always the beginning, is, is Kita Aleph of Tshuva. Why is vidu the beginning of Tshuva? Because vidu is the beginning of taking responsibility for your own actions. By saying, I've done it, then you are, you've taken responsibility for it. Now you can do Tshuva, right? But you can't do Tshuva until you've said vidu. So vidu is always Kita Aleph, is always, always the first step. The Oshamnu, Bogadnu, the Alchait, that's the first step towards doing tshuva, self-improvement. Where does that begin? Funnily enough, it is a bit paradoxical that someone like Kayin teaches us about, uh, about Vido. He, he confesses to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Right? The, uh, you know, in, 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 a, in another religion, uh, the, 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 the clergy take confessions. You know, the, uh, in, in, in Christianity, the, the confessions are done to the bishops or to the priests, right? But in the Torah, the only person we confess to is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I remember once or twice, somebody came to me in the community and said, Rabbi, I must tell you, I must confess. And I stopped in mid-sentence and I said, I, I don't take confessions. There's a guy, there's a guy down the road. I can, I can recommend to you the vicar down the road. Uh, he, takes, he takes confessions. I don't, I, don't, I, don't do, I don't do confessions. You want to confess something, speak to the Rabbi Nishlelam. Uh, that's that's that is the Torah. That's the Jewish way of doing things. Um, but uh, uh, Dina, you want to say something? Yes, but really, he didn't confess in the beginning. First, he said, "You know, my my brother's keeper." After he maybe got the punishment, then he confessed. So it's not really like a straight vidor. Good. <laughs> okay. And Dina makes a very valid point. Makes a valid point that his his vidui is indeed a vidui, the Ramban accepts it as a vidui, but I agree with you, his vidui is not uh, kosher la mahadre. It's, 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 not an, an, it's not an instant recognition of chait, right? Initially, he says, as he says, initially he says, Hashem uh, ochi That's a very good point. So, so Kayan remains for us a villain, there's no question about it. He remains a villain, he remains a murderer, but he, according to the Ramban, he does tshuva. Let's have a look at this. Let's have a look at this Rabban a bit more carefully. It says the Ramban, the Hanochom, Hanochom bepshat shehu vidui. Omar, what did what did what did uh, Kayan say? Ms. It is true, ki avoni godo milisloach. That actually my sin is so great that it's gadol milisloach. What does that mean? It's 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 unforgivable. Unforgivable. The tzaddik ato Hashem, and you, Akarish Baruch Hu, are correct in your judgment. The Yosha Mishpotecha, and your ju- I acknowledge the Mishpatei Hashem. Right. The actual fact, right, that this is really the, the 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 if you like the foundation of the whole idea of uh, of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. I said is to recognize. HaKadosh Baruch Hu as HaMelech HaMishpat. For Yosha Mishpatech, Af al Pisha Nashto Osi Harbe Maud, even though you have given me a devastating punishment, the Hine Gerashta Osi Hayomi Al Paneho Adama, and you have expelled me from fe- ever feeling again uh, comfortable and secure on the land, Kibiyosi Nova Nod, by being moving around all the time, La Ucho Lamo de Mokam Echot. I won't be able to live anywhere. This is all the Ramban. The Ramban is filling in the blanks here. He's explaining what Kayan means by God of Avonim in a soul. Saying, I accept the punishment. I accept your judgment. My deed is indeed unforgivable. I can no longer even stand before you, God, and Davin. Right, this is language you get later on in the Nevi'im. We find in our slichas that we are ashamed of the things we have done wrong. 
כי נסוסי חרפוסי נאורו, אבל מה עשר? כל מוצא ירגני. And what he says, Takarish Baruch Hu, is, but now I am extremely vulnerable. Anybody who sees me will be able to kill me, right? Even though he's not really afraid of other people. There aren't many human beings around, but I don't know. There are animals around. There are predators around, lions, tigers, maybe even one or two dinosaurs. I don't know. Whatever it is, there are animals around that threaten my life. In your chesed, you haven't condemned me to death. But you, 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 and that's what he means here in this posuk. So the next posuk that Kayan says, "Hengei rash to osi hayo mel pneyo adama liponecha." So he's now kol motza ayah hargeni. That is so his claim. That the Rishparko is for hoyo kol motza ayah hargeni. Anyone who finds me uh, will will kill me. So he's he's he is in fact asking the Rishparko for protection. Right. So there's an interesting word here in hein. The word hain is interesting here. What does he mean? Hain gerashta osi hayom al pnei adam, right? So he translated hain means since. But I want to show you here a very interesting little piece here from the Ksava Kabola. Ksava Kabola is a very interesting commentary on the Chumash, one of, by one of the great uh, um, uh, great rabbonim of Germany two hundred years ago, uh, Rabbi Yaakov Tzvi Mecklenburg. And who was a, a great Talmud Chacham and a great Rav, and he wrote this commentary on the Chumash Haksav by Kabbalah. So he says, "Hein gei Rashta." I'd like to just look at a few words. Hein gei Rashta ladaiti amuchuvam b'mikra. My view about how understanding this pasuk is havidui hagemura that this was a complete confession. Shehizvade kain b'chol leiv. Kain recognized fully his sin. What a terrible thing I have done. So in other words, again, the Ksava Kabbalah is also coming to spell out, right, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the intensity of Kayin's vidui. And I am accepting your judgment. That from now on I will be sort of like a, a refugee. Umilat hein. So he picks up this one word hein, which I also was interested. I wanted to find somebody who spoke about the word hein. The hein word hein is a very unusual word in the in the Tanakh. So he says hein comes mishameshes is used lahatstik divrei chavera to to endorse somebody else's statement. And here we've got a fabulous German word. If there are any, if there are any good German uh, um, native German speakers here, can maybe help me out. Uh, this this word here reads rechts ankenungswort. Rechts ankenungswort, which seems to mean that it, acknowledging the correctness of a statement. Recht means correct. Ankenung means acknowledging, and vort means a statement. Okay, so recht ankenung's vort. There we go. This is uh, th this German rov is like like you find nowadays in English commentators sometimes throw in an English word here and there. So he gives us gives us a lovely juicy a uh, German a uh, German word, and the Germans like sort of very long words, and uh, and with all the verbs came at the end, you have to fit it all back together again. Anyhow. So he says, you find in the Gemara sometimes that if a person comes in the Gemara, it says, a person claims from somebody else a debt, it says, you owe me a hundred thousand, whatever it is, for Omale Hain. And if the other person says Hain, Hain means, yes, I acknowledge my debt. That's what Hain means, right? Says the Salva Kabbalah, that's how to read this Pasuk. He says, Hain. This is the Apostle Kayan says to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hein gerashta osi haya. I acknowledge the correctness of what you've done. Right? And also it says, V'chein oma lovon li Yaakov, Hein lu yi kidvorecha. That lovon, when Yaakov says, I'll be willing to work for you for seven years for your daughter, lovon says, Hein, yes, I accept your conditions. 
But then Lavon, who was the, most, the, the ultimate slippery character, he never says completely, yes, he says, Lu Yehid Kedvorecha, means, means that halavai, it should work as you, as you suggested, which means really it isn't going to work. I'm, I'm going to make sure it's not going to work as you suggest. Okay, but that, that's Lava. Anyhow, so he says here, the tam hein the tam hein gerashta the tzedek of a mishpat gerashta osi. I accept the justice of your. And here he gives us also another bit of German here. Can't quite make out this word. Recht messig. Anybody got any ideas about recht messig? Um, recht means I think justice, and messig means something to do with measurement. In other words, this it, it, it's correct. It's correctly judged. Probably recht messig means it's a correct judgment. And here, this word here, fetripst du mich, you are punishing me. In other words, your punishment is fitting. Okay, enough German and, uh, and, and commentary for the moment. Uh, and then what's interesting is, Vayomelo Hashem, Lochein kol horeg kain shivosim yukov. So he, he gives kain. A, a, a protection. He says, no, you don't deserve to be killed. Why doesn't he deserve to be killed? It seems to be he doesn't deserve a capital punishment because he's done tshuva. Even tshuva even works for the murder of his brother. In other words, this story has behind it a very fascinating a concept. The concept of tshuva, of vidui and tshuva, really begins uh, with Kayin, and he's told um, what exactly it means, Shiva Sai, newcomer's different story. And here comes an interesting thing. By Yosem Hashem Lakayin Os. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave Kayin a sign. What exactly is this sign? This is one of the mysterious issues in this whole story. He gave him a sign, right? And in actual fact, in, in Western literature, the, the, the phrase, the mark of Cain, you might have, you might have heard used, the mark of Cain. But interestingly, in the English literature, the mark of Cain is meant to be something negative, something negative. If I'm not mistaken, in, in, the, in, the, in the centuries of, of uh, black slavery, when Europe was dealing heavily in, in black slaves from Africa, right? So that in black slavery, they justified their black slavery by saying that the black skin was a mark of Cain, that a man who has black skin is marked out uh, to be a, a bad person. And that somehow justified slavery. And that was always being misused and abused and misinterpreted in, 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 in Christian and Western culture, something terrible, uh, the mark of Cain. In actual fact, in the Posuk, it means pretty much exactly the opposite. The, 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 the os, the os, the sign that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave Cain was meant to do what? It was meant to protect him. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave him a sign, levilti hakos oso kolmozo, that nobody should be able to kill it. In other words, he gave him a protection. It says normally somebody who is wandering around uh, is vulnerable, I'm giving you this, and what was this sign? Right? So the Orachayim says the word os, a sign, is often connected to Shmira, a sign for protection. So he says, a posuk in Shemos Rabbah, a posuk, Ohoyo Hadam Lochem Laos. Where is that written? That's written in, in, in Parsha Shemos, that, you, that the Klal Yisrael were told the Yetzirah Mitzrayim to put the blood on the doorpost. And by putting the blood on the doorpost, they were protected from Machas Pechorus. And the posse there says these four words, hadam lochem laos. The, bl the blood should be for you as a sign, says the Orachayim. What does it mean, a sign? It means laos mitzvah lohem l'shmira. The sign of a mitzvah, which will be a shmira, which will protect them. The idea of an os being a protection. Is something very interesting. But what was the sign? Rashi's got a very interesting. Uh, um, I thought I had Rashi here somewhere. No. So Rashi says something quite extraordinary. 
I, I thought I brought it, but I didn't. Rashi says, that what does it mean, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave Kai in an os? Rashi says an os means a letter from the alphabet. And in this particular case, it means a letter from the Shem Hashem. He gave him somewhere written on his skin, on his, on his forehead, or on his arm, whatever it was, who gave him a letter, an os Hashem. What letter was it? We're not told. There is a medrash that it was the letter Vov. Exactly why it's the letter Vov and why that's a Shemira and why that's what Akarish Baruch gives him. I'm afraid this is all something a little mysterious. There is in more Kabbalistic literature a bit about this, but that's not my department so much. Bakol Panim, the, 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 the sign of Kayin was a sign of um, uh, uh, was a sign of protection. Okay, so what have we learned so far? That Cain, even though he is the villain, the murderer, the jealous, the egoist, the egotist, the selfish person, nevertheless, there's something he has a redeeming value. His redeeming value is that he knows to say a vidui, and he knows to accept hamelech hamishpat. He knows how to do that, right? And he's the first person in the Torah to give us this idea of a, of a tshuva. And there are a lot of midrashim about this. There are midrashim which speak about Odom Horishan meeting Cain and asking Cain what happened in your judgment before HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And Cain says to him, I did tshuva. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu accepted my tshuva. At which point Odom Horishan says, I had no idea that the power of tshuva was that, was so powerful that even murder could be uh, uh, um, in some way uh, uh, remedied by the power of tshuva. Okay, let's move on. Vayetu uh, Kayim no kidmas eden, Vayetu Kayim is ishto, Kayim gives birth to a child. Vatav Vatayel is chanoch, Vahi bone ir, rik shem ha'ir, shem beno chanoch. He, he gives birth to a child, which is called Hanoch. Now, what's in, one of the interesting things is that in terms of, it's an interesting thing, in terms of the names that we give our children, right? It's interesting that these early chapters of the Torah give us lots of names, which have, were never accepted by Klal Yisrael, right? Um, as names, except for Hanoch, for some reason, Chanoch was accepted as a good Jewish name to give to your son, right? Um, no one's called Odom, and no one's called Shais, and, and, and no one is called... Uh, uh, okay, so the next person, of course, is Noach. Noach also becomes a name that is acceptable. This is actually a subject for a different Shia, but it is interesting to see how Jewish names um, over the over the millennia of Jewish history, certain names were accepted, um, other names weren't. We'll see in a minute that um, Odom and Chava have a third son called Sheis, Shin Taf, right? Translated into English often as Seth, S-E-T-H, okay? Now, there are Christians who call their kids Seth, and there are Mormons who call their kids Seth, but I've never met uh, Jewish parents who call their kid uh, Shais or Seth, certainly not in the Torah knowledgeable community, that wasn't a name that was acceptable for reasons that are not entirely clear to me, right? And Adam also not, I've never come across Adam um, as an acceptable uh, a, a Jewish name. And this is a little bit, it's a bit curious. Uh, and it's also interesting how, how in the time of Chazal, Right, uh, the uh, somebody just sent me uh, a message that they have from friends who, who use the word Adam and Chess. Is that right, Shirley? Okay, okay, it, it's 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 very uncommon, it's very uncommon, and I think it's it's. Uh, I've actually had the opportunity once to have a long conversation with my uh, Rebbe Zechatzarit Livracha with the Zalman Erbach on the question of names and names for children. Um, 
And uh, he said to me quite clearly that there definitely are some names which are acceptable in Klal Yisrael and other names which were not accepted. I mean, I know the names of many hundreds of Rishonim and Achronim and Tanoim and Amaroim, and these names, Odom and Shes, were never ever accepted in Klal Yisrael. I'm not saying that it's a, I'm not, I'm not saying, Shirley, that your friends uh, have done something terrible, but I, they've certainly done something highly unusual. And the tradition of Klal Yisrael has gone down a different, uh, a, a different route. I was actually speaking to Rosh Zalman at the time about using the name Shem. Right? Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yafet, right? Shem, Ham, and Yafet, the three sons of Noah. Of the three, Shem was the best. And Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov eventually are descended from Shem. Eventually are descended from Shem, right? And yet, Shlem Zalman told me, Shem is not an acceptable name in Klalis. Just isn't. Fact. I asked him, why not? He says, I haven't got a clue. So I've got no idea. Uh, why, why not? But it just isn't. Uh, the name Shem was never accepted in Klai where, where the first, Why am I mentioning all this? Because suddenly we come across the name Chanoch, right? The name Chanoch. And uh, I remember when I started my rabbinic career in London, uh, the name of the Av Bezdin, of the London Bezdin, was Chanoch Erentroy. And Lahavdil ben Chaim Lachaim, the name of the Rosh Bezdin of the Kadassia was Chanoch Padva. So there were two Chanochs who were the Roche Bezdin in the whole of the UK. Uh, that name was the, uh, the, the most uh, significant name in the rabbinic world, really, uh, in, in, the, in the Orthodox uh, Jewish world. Uh, they were the two Chanochs. And you have to be clear when you said Rav Chanoch said this or that about which Chanoch you were talking about. Anyhow, Uncle Bonim, Chanoch seems to have been a name that was accepted. Shem wasn't. Um, again, I don't want you to misread me. I don't want you to come away from this Shia saying that anybody who calls their kid Shem or Adam or, or whatever um, is, is not acceptable. Although it does, it does occur to me that actually I may be wrong when I say that Chanoch is the earliest name, because of course there is also the name Chava. Chava is a name that was accepted in Klal Yisra, that women, called, women were called Chava. So that's probably, Chava's probably the earliest name. And then later on in the Middle Ages, you get a whole new level of names that no one's ever heard of before. Names like Chaim, right? The whole of the Tanakh and the Mishnah and the Gemara, no one's ever called Chaim. No one's ever heard of the name Chaim or Simcha or anything like that at all. These names only came in really in the Middle Ages um, uh, and Baruch and Simcha and Chaim. Uh, these were nouns, they weren't names. Uh, they were really words in the, in the Hebrew language. To use them as names was something um, in, innovative. But again, in Klal Yisrael, that became uh, acceptable, and that's uh, and, and that's uh, that's fine. Okay, I don't, I don't I don't really know why I got sidetracked on this subject, but it is an interesting it is an interesting subject. And here we have uh, Chanoch. We have here Chanoch. What title is Chanoch? Cain gives birth to Chanoch, and they build a city. Hashem Beno Chanoch. Okay, what exactly it means to build a city when you only have a handful of people on the earth at the time? It's not entirely clear. More about that maybe at some other time. Again, the Ksava Kabbalah uh, is interested in the word Chanoch, because we know what the word Chanoch means. Chanoch means Chinoch. It means education. It means to develop oneself spiritually and intellectually. It, me it means to, to nurture the human being, to develop their positive qualities. That's what chinuch means. That's what education means. It says the Ksava Kabbalah, Himtzi Eitzah Benafsha. Cain had an idea for himself, all part of his tshuva process, Likro Shem Beno, Beshem Iro Chanuch that both his son and the place that he was building, he called them Chanoch, and he chose this as a constant sign. Look at this beautiful piece of, of, of uh, interpretation of the Tzavah Kabbalah. 
Why does Kayin call his son Hanuk? Because he wants to have a constant reminder, Shehu Katinok, that he, Kayin, is like a young, a young kid, Hanitzrach el Achinuch Varagilus, who needs to re educate himself. Ulehisragel Ma'at Ma'at, to become slowly more and more accustomed, Lizgarev el Hashem. I find this piece of Ksav uh, Kabbalah uh, 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 very, very interesting. In other words, he's saying, when the Torah says that Kayin called his son Chanoch, it was all part of his tshuva, part of his realization that saying vidui is only step one, but step two is Kabbalah la'osit, is going forward, uh, an intention to improve in the future, and one only improves through Chinuch, through self-education, through improvement, self-improvement, and that is why he calls his son Chanoch, according to Aksav Kabbalah. And if that's true, then that may be a good reason why Chanoch was an acceptable name, because it actually was invented by Kayim to carry the idea of self-improvement. So he says here, summarizing the chapter, Aksav Kabbalah says, Hide is boya. We see clearly, you mustn't come away from chapter four just thinking this is an interesting bit of drama, an interesting story, Kain and Hever. The whole of chapter four, says Xavier Kabbalah, is to teach us the immense power of tshuva. So much so that even the worst possible sin, meaning murder, the tshuva worked. Okay, so this is basically something we can learn from Kayin. Uh, the, the, the power of tshuva and, and the chanoch possibility. What's interesting is the next few psukim, I'm not going to go into, um, except there are one or two, int- what happens now is the descendants of Kayin develop what we would call uh, civilization. So he says that at first he had uh, someone called Yavol, who haya avi yoshev ohelu mikne. So there was somebody called Yavol who somehow innovated um, the idea of tent dwelling. Well, I, I imagine that tent dwelling was the next stage after cave dwelling. People lived in caves and then they lived in tents. And look at the next one, which is very interesting. Vashem ochiv Yuval. Yuval became quite a popular Hebrew name, right, in modern Israel. And who was Yuval? Yuval was who, oops, who, who haya ovi koltofes kidno v'ugov. He was the first musician. He was the first person to make musical instruments and start music. So here you have people living in tents. They've got, they've, they've developed music, right? These are Cain's descendants who are developing what we might call culture, right? Music, a resi- residence, right? And then you have Tuval Kayin. Tuval Kayin, Lotish Kol Choresh Nechoshe Zubazel. He was forged all implements of copper and iron. This is the Iron Age, right? This is starting to make implements out of melted, melted iron and steel. And it's, and it's two things. It's also choresh, it's used as a agricultural plow, but lotesh also means a sword. In other words, he, he created weapons and he created all types of metal implements. So much so that Rashi says, Tuval Kayin, Tovel Umunoso Shal Kayin. He was following the, the, uh, um, the, the bad ways of Kayin, Tuva Loshan Tavlin. Interesting. The word Tavlin means a condiment or a spice, which is meant to bring out the flavor of the food. So he says, Tibel the Hitkin Emonosha Kayin, Lasos Kleizayin Lerot. That he made, he made uh, um, uh, weapons for people, people who wanted to murder, like Kayin had murdered. Okay, so some of the descendants. Now look at this last sentence here. The Achos Tuvalkayin Namo. Tuvalkayin, the sister of Tuvalkayin was called Namo. Why are we interested in that? 
Does anybody know who was Naamot? I'm asking a question, ladies and gentlemen. She was the wife of Noah. No, she was the wife of Noah, even though the Pasuk here doesn't mention it. But have a look, Rashi does. Rashi says Naama, and this has also become a, a, a popular name in Israel nowadays. Naama, he is Noah. Rashi is drawing on the Medrash that Naama was the wife of Noah. What is, what is amazing about the fact that Naama is the wife of Noah? <laughs> What is interesting about that? <coughs> so I want to just give you a big picture. If, if, if Adam and Chava have got three children, Cain, Hevel, and Shais, these are the three children they've got, right? Cain kills Hevel. Hevel dies without leaving behind any descendants. So the rest of the world is built on Cain and Shais. What happens in the next parsha is the flood. Everybody is killed except for Noah and his family, and, and we are now B'nai Noah. Right? Human beings are referred to by Chazal as not B'nai Odom, but B'nai Noah. We're the children of Noah because we all descended from Noah. So you might have thought, says Rashi, that the genetic line of Cain was completely lost for all times because Noah is a descendant of Shais. So if you take a family tree, Cain is lost. But what have we just now seen? That Naama was Achos Noach. That actual fact, <clears throat> Mrs. Noach was a descendant of Cain. So Cain leaves behind definitely descendants. And what's interesting is, in that sense, if you take this from a spiritual, if you like, symbolic point of view, the, 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 the qualities of Cain, both the negative qualities, his aggression and his and his possessiveness and his jealousy on the one hand, but also his understanding, his understanding of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and of Tshuva and of Vidui, that did transmit itself through the generations, and Noah's wife brings into the table with her the genetic material from Cain. Are you following me? So B'nai Noach are a combination of Shes and, and Cain. And Cain, you can see, also has tremendous strengths. It's not for nothing the Torah says that the descendants of Cain uh, invented and innovated new ways of living, new ways of, of <clears throat> uh, creating metal implements, new ways of making music. In other words, civilization needs Cain. The power of Cain. But the, the Torah gives us chapter four as a sort of a health warning. The descendants of Cain come with a heavy amount of selfishness, egoism, and a tendency to violence. And that is really the dark side of Cain, which later on, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and the Tshrotim, they modify it. And, and, uh, uh, and, and that is one of the important central themes of, of Safer Bracious. Now, I haven't had time today, I haven't had time today to, to speak about Shace. Maybe the next year I'll just say a few words about him because Shays spelled Shein Tough. He is really the future of the world. An actual word for those people interested in the Hebrew language, the word Shays, Shein Tough, um, is an important root word in the Hebrew language. Uh, it comes out, for example, uh, when you're building a building. Any building that is built, before you build the building, you build a Tashtit. The Tashtit is the foundations. Shin taf is, is a word of, of, of the tashtit, which are the foundations of the world. And Chazal say that Shais got his name because Olov Hushtat Olov, the whole future of the world was built on the foundations of this one man Shais, which we'll look at maybe next time. <clears throat> um, that's, all for, that's all for today. I wanted to really bring this chapter four a little bit into contemporary relevance both in terms of this week's Pashta Shavua, the Hagrizim and Ha'evol expressed the Kali Yisrael Aravim Zelozeh, which was the remedy to Kayin's statement of Hashem Ochi Anochi, and also in terms of Aseris Tshuva that's coming up, the Vidui of Kayin, the understanding that irrespective of where you're coming from or what you've done, the Vidui and the Tshuva uh, can create completely new worlds and Cain received uh, uh, forgiveness uh, from Akash Baruch Hu. All these fundamental ideas are in Barashas chapter four. 
That's it for today, ladies and gentlemen.